Greetings, loved ones. Child grooming is a deliberate process by which offenders gradually initiate and maintain sexual relationships with victims in secrecy. Today we're going to talk about grooming and red flag behaviors. But first, help us get these messages out. Subscribe to our channel. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Hit the like button and the notification bell, and please share these messages with others. So let's discuss grooming and red flag behaviors. As I said, child grooming is a deliberate process by which offenders gradually initiate and maintain sexual relationships with victims in secrecy. Grooming allows offenders to slowly overcome natural boundaries long before sexual abuse occurs. On the surface, grooming a child can look like a close relationship between the offending adult, the targeted child, and potentially the child's caregivers. This grooming process is often misleading because the offender may be well-known or highly regarded in the community, and as a result, it is easy to trust them. So let's talk about stages of grooming. The first stage, the offender targets the child. Perpetrators may target and exploit a child's perceived vulnerabilities, including emotional neediness, isolation, neglect, a chaotic home life, or lack of personal oversight, etc. The offender will pay special attention to or give preference to a child. In the next stage, they gain the child's and the caregiver's trust. Perpetrators work to gain the trust of parents and caregivers to lower suspicion, gain access to the child by providing seemingly warm yet calculated attention and support. And the perpetrator gains the child's trust by gathering information about the child, getting to know their needs, and finding ways to fill those needs. So when you have this, he'll say something like, I saw you reading the new Superman comic, or I'm planning to go see the new movie. Um, I can take you if you want to go. These are examples. Another stage is filling a need. So once the perpetrator begins to fill the child's needs, they may assume noticeably, noticeably, ugh, they may assume noticeably more importance in the child's life. Perpetrators utilize tactics such as gift-giving, flattery, giving money, and meeting other basic needs. Tactics may also include increased attention and affection toward the targeted child. And they'll do things like, I know you love jewelry, so I got you this watch, or, you know, um, just different things to give them and get their attention. The next stage is isolating the child. And this is where you need to be really wary. The perpetrator uses isolation tactics to reinforce their relationship with the child by creating situations in which they are alone together, like babysitting, one-on-one -on -one coaching, or special trips. The perpetrator may reinforce the relationship with the child by cultivating a sense that they love and they understand the child in ways that others, even their parents, cannot. And the adult can start to tell the child that no one cares for them the way they do, not even their parents. And so they'll say, you can trust me because no one understands you the way I do. The next stage is sexualizing the relationship. This is really important. Pay attention. Once emotional dependence and trust have been built, the perpetrator progressively sexualizes the relationship. And this occurs through talking and pictures and creating situations in which both are naked, like swimming. The adult will exploit the child's natural curiosity and trust using stimulation to advance the sexual nature of the relationship. So they'll say things like, have you ever masturbated? Or I can show you how it feels really good. These are traps. Then they're going to work on maintaining control. So once the sexual abuse occurs, perpetrators commonly use secrecy, blame, and threats to maintain the child's participation and continued silence. In order to maintain control, perpetrators use emotional manipulation. They make the child believe they are the only person who can meet their emotional and material needs. And the child may feel that the loss of the relationship or the consequences of exposing it 
will be more damaging and humiliating than continuing the unhealthy relationship. So, for example, they'll say things like, if you tell anyone, we could both go to jail, or we won't be able to be together, or if you tell anyone, something bad could happen to your family. So think about these things. So if you see any of these red flag behaviors, report the situation to the authorities and stop all contact between the child and the adult. According to the CDC, over half of all the children in the world, that's 1 billion children ages 2 to 17, experience violence every year. So the question is not if you will encounter a victim of violence. The question before God is what will you do when you do encounter them? You could be the person who saves a life. Micah 6.8 says, He showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. You are called. We are all called to be champions for justice. And if you're a victim, I want you to know there is a way out. It is not your fault. Abuse is not love. You are not alone. If you are suffering violence, reach out to someone today. If you find yourself in a dangerous situation, call 911 for help. If you know of a child or another person suffering violence, tell the authorities. In our next episode, we will discuss how to recognize red flag behaviors in more detail. Until then, God bless you.